Now I'm going to introduce you to our awesome author. Rita Williams Garcia, a Queens, New York native, is, is the celebrated author of novels for young adults and middle grade readers. Her most recent novel, Clayton Bird Goes Underground, won the 2018 NAACP Image Award for Literature for Young People and was a 2017 National Book Award finalist. Williams Garcia is most known for her Coretta Scott King Author Award winning, winning and the Scott O'Deal Prize for the historical fiction. She's both a three-time Coretta Scott King Author Award recipient and a National Book Award finalist. Her forthcoming her forthcoming YA historical novel, A Sinning in St. James, is scheduled for release in May 2021. Welcome, Re welcome, Rita. We are so honored to have you here. Please take it away. All righty. Oh, thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful introduction and welcome. I could, even though you're like, you know, everybody had different um, reactions and, and everything, I just, I can feel the, um, the enthusiasm and the joy. Um, I wanted to click on joy. I kept trying to click, but um, panelists cannot click. Anyway, let me tell you just a little bit about myself um, because um, I wanna, you know, I wanna make sure I answer your questions. So uh, let's get rolling. Well, um, I, Oh, I, I grew up loving story. Um, I could tell myself stories when I was a little child and um, I learned to read early. So I was always reading. And, um, and then I loved making up stories and I wrote all the time. I couldn't help myself. Um, I even kept a diary. Uh, this is my fourth grade diary. And I kept all kinds of things in here. Everything from, hmm, let's see, what have we got? Um, uh, we made a, uh, let's see, we made a mask at preschool. Um, okay. And, um, hmm. <laughs> and, oh, um, Miss Barbara doesn't want to teach music with us anymore. I wonder what we did in music class. Anyway, so I had all kinds of silliness going on in my diary, but I also had, um, I also paid attention to what was going on in the world. Um, on, uh, on March the 3rd in 1968, uh, oh, okay, I don't know if you can actually read that, but I saw Robert, Robert F. Kennedy at the airport. Um, and he was campaigning to become the president. Unfortunately, Robert F. Kennedy was assassinated months later. And I have that in this diary. But also, um, I also have noted Martin L. King. I don't, oh, can you see that? Martin L. King died. And then the next day we had an assembly honoring Martin Luther King and white children were laughing and that made Miss Dixon cry. Miss Dixon was our was one of the uh, few teachers um, at my uh, one of my few, one of the few uh, black teachers at my elementary school. Um, so I kept all kinds of things in here hmm. and. So when it was time for me to write One Crazy Summer or to think about it, I thought, let me read my diary because this happens in 1967 and 1968. Hmm, I wonder if there's anything in here that, that would be useful. So I'm glad I kept the diary. But also while I was young, I mean, I, I just knew I was gonna be a published author. So I went to my neighborhood library and I checked out a book on um, like how to submit a story, how to be a writer. So like the writer's market and the writer's digest. And I learned how to prepare a manuscript and send it to a publisher. And so I was writing 500 words every night um, because I wanted my writing muscles to be strong. I heard that if you, uh, that, Publishers paid like five cents or 10 cents for a word. So I would write 500 words every night, just getting ready, getting ready, exercising my writing muscles. Um, but I was also sending out my stories. Now, all the stories that I sent out, uh, you know, they were from a beginning writer and I was like 12 years old. And, and so, um, so yeah, a, a, a lot of times they, um, uh, they, rejected my stories. 
And you would think that that would discourage me, but it didn't discourage me. I just kept writing and I got a little better. And eventually two years later, I sold a story to Highlights Magazine. This is my first story. It's called Benji Speaks. And it's a story about a boy who wants to to, um, who wants to talk to birds. And, um, and so his brother makes him a, a whistle out of bamboo. Now, so what do I know about um, uh, the Philippines and, and birds and bamboo? Well, only what um, my fellow classmate Corazon Velasquez told me. Um, she came straight from the Philippines and the teacher sat her next to me so that she could pick up some English. And we became fast friends and she would tell me all about the Philippines. So when I wrote a story, I thought, let me use the Philippines. Let me use what little bit I know. Um, so I kind of still do the same thing. I, I get a little bit, of, I get some information and I do some research and that helps me to build my story and to make it bigger and to like really give it details so that it feels real uh, to this day. So you saw my, you saw my uh, notebook where I was handwriting my story. Well, I still do the same thing. I don't just type out my story. I handwrite it. Uh, can, you see, can you see my scribbling? Yes, this is actually um, a notebook from, uh, not from One Crazy Summer, but this is from um, the third book in the series, Gone Crazy in Alabama. Um, I, I love to handwrite. I feel the rhythm of the words when I handwrite. I feel connected to the story when I write. And so I, uh, so I write, handwrite all of my stories. I recently finished writing a novel, A Sitting in St. James, as was mentioned in my, um, in the introduction, this is my new book. And it's like nearly 500 pages. You better believe I hand wrote each and every page uh, before I began to type it. It's, I, I guess it's just the way that I do it. You'll find your own way of doing it. Some people um, speak into recorders um, and you know uh, stuff like that, but I'm, I'm such a hand writer. It just feels natural to me. Uh, so um, one of the other things that I had to do because if I was gonna write about um, 1968, boy, I would need research because even my diary doesn't have all of the stuff that, that was going to on back then. And I couldn't, I can't rely on my memories. So I did research. And one of the things that was important to me was the um, having this, this collection of the Black Panther intercommunal news. Uh, and these are all of the newspapers put that the, uh, that the Black Panthers put out um, and uh, in one of the chapters of, um, of One Crazy Summer, Delphine is trying to sneak um, a read of one of the newspaper because she doesn't quite have the money to, um, to, to buy the 25 cent paper. But this became such a resource for me because then I, I got the story. For me, I got a lot of the Black Panther um, um, the Black Panther, um, the, the, the philosophy and what was actually going on from their point of view. See, everything else is uh, from uh, people recording histories, but this is actually from the Black Panthers during, um, as it was happening in their news. Uh, so I was very, uh, so I, like this became very important to me. Another part of you know what was what was important to me was having was having um, this this book. Um, it's an it's a book of the black uh, Black Panther Revolution artist um, Emery Douglas. And when I was growing up, I would see his posters posted all throughout my neighborhood. Okay, so it just really felt like, the, you know, the Black Panthers were in our community. And if you look at a lot of, like, even see the covers, you know, uh, there's, there's not a lot of what we might call joy in the pictures. You know, it's not a lot of people smiling and happy. You know, uh, a lot of this, 
really okay might have a little shine from my light but it reflects the revolution um, and the oppression that black people were feeling but it also has you know quite a bit of um like it, it has some some levity in it too but the reason why this was important to me was because i wanted i wanted to feel what people were feeling uh, especially in this um um in in this movement um as far as levity is concerned um so i i really like this picture so I don't know if you can see this again because of the shine, uh, but these are these are two kids who are potty training, right? And so the caption says, "I wonder if Nixon is bugging us now." And Nixon was the president during that time, and um, uh, and and yes, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of civil rights leaders and activists were bugged by the FBI. Um, uh, even Dr. Martin Luther King, nonviolent Dr. Martin Luther King was bugged um, by the FBI. And so, and so it was, it was just uh, really important to like kind of, uh, to kind of get uh, these things that were going on. Um, and to kind of put them inside One Crazy Summer, there is a point where Cecile says to the girls, who are you working for? Are you working for the man? You know, um, things did happen like that. People were infiltrated. Uh, they they came to, uh, they came to, um, uh, um, they were either contacted by or they were in a compromised position or they were recruited to infiltrate Black Panthers and to either get information or sometimes feed information, okay, to have, um, um, to have messages brought into the organization or to cause disruption and trouble. So I wanted to also reflect that. Um, even though the, all that stuff is happening at the adult level, I wanted, I really wanted to reflect that uh, um, in this story. But um, one of the things um, that really drew me to telling this story, Okay, so, so here you see pictures with children. Um, and that, that was a thing I thought of mainly is that um, this was a movement where the, where the leaders were thinking about not just themselves um, and a, a grab for power, even though their motto was power to the people, but think of that, it was to the people. And when they said the people, that included the children. And so there was a place for children. Um, children were served, but children were also participating. So here we have a picture of, of two kids and they're holding posters, okay? So um, I wanted to reflect that, that children were not just being, um, being served, um, that, that they were a part of it but also they could have been put in a perilous situation, in, in a dangerous situation. So everybody was kind of fighting for freedom and for rights and for, for basic human rights. And so I wanted to kind of really put all of that into the story, but without so much beating you over the head with it um, so that you could um, see it going on and see the children participating, um, but not just hearing a lot of speeches from the adults, uh, which, um, which would have, I, I, I guess it would have been direct, but um, you know, um, I, I really like things from the ground level, from uh, from the young people who were involved. Um, I myself, um, uh, my family fell on hard times when we were, uh, when, when I was about like 12 years old, 12, 13 years old, my father was in the army. He was in Vietnam. And when he came home from Vietnam, um, you know, he, he had undergone some changes and then he was uh, dis. Uh, discharged from the army and after that we had to leave army life and return to civilian life and we lived with our grandmother his father and uh, rather his mother and um 
And so during that time, you know, we had a hard time. So we had, uh, they, they had the Black Panthers in the neighborhood. And so, um, and so we, had uh, we had had a breakfast, um, a, like two breakfasts, courtesy of the Black Panthers. So I know a little, a little something firsthand. My sister knows more, be, uh, um, but I know a little something firsthand about the Black Panthers and, and seeing the Black Panthers in the neighborhood. I never saw them with guns <laughs> marching around, but they, but they, um, but they did believe in being armed. Um, because they were originally the uh, Black Panthers for self-defense. And the reason why they were the Black Panthers for self-defense is because they had to defend themselves and the citizens in the neighborhood from who? From the police who would randomly um, abuse um, uh, people in the neighborhood. And so, um, and so then the Black Panthers came about as a result. So, um, so, um, so this movement really had an impact on me and I always knew that I was going to write this story, but I just thought, hmm, instead of writing it about teenagers and for teenagers, which is what I would normally do because a lot of black, um, Panthers were, they were like, um, you know, they were teens, they were like 15, 16, 17, you know, um, and and so they like when you see the movies about Black Panthers, they're usually like 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 thirty years old or something. Well, you had a few older, but a lot of them were they were college age and younger. So uh, that's the reason why I thought hmm, I'm going to write the story for with younger characters, and um, so that the readers and uh, so that the readers can discover. Um, the world of um, the, mil the militant Black Panthers in the 1960s, along with the characters. And so in that way, they can both go on a journey together. So um, I believe my, I believe my, um, hmm, I believe my, uh, my uh, 20 minutes <laughs> of talking has come to a close. So I would love to be able to answer questions. Um, and um, um, should I answer, um, oh, uh, post them and yes, and I will, yes, okay. I have two qu questions, yes. Your questions, please. All right, Jafia, if you can go ahead and start moderating, that'd be wonderful. Sure. Okay. Um, thank you so much for sharing about your book, Rita. Um, I can't wait to read the next two books and the Gaither series. Um, I also love the relationship and the bond between the three sisters um, and appreciated how even though this book was like set in the 60s, so like a few years back, um, it's also relevant to the issues that we are facing in the world today, like inequality and the need for racial justice. It's powerful, especially for young people like me. Um, so now we are going to, to transition to questions and answers from our wonderful audience. Now is your chance to submit questions if you haven't done so already in the Q&A. We are going to try our best to get through all of the questions if possible. That would be great. The first question is from Soraya. I'm sorry if I said that wrong. Um, Soraya was asking, how did you make that book and how did you feel when you made the book? Well, um, so you got a chance to see a little bit. I did look at my diary just so that I could remember. Because, okay, so when I was writing it, I was like in my, how old was I? I think I was, at, yeah, I was in my 50s when I was writing it. Um, and, and so I had to kind of remember what was it like to be 11? It really did help that I had a diary to read just so that I could see, you know, like what kinds of thoughts were I thinking back then? And just to kind of plug in. But I also had to remember, you see, you all um, at, at, at your, at age, a person now at age 11 is a whole lot more sophisticated 
than I would say a person of 11 way back in 1968. So I had to remember to kind of balance the two, to have kind of the innocence of, um, of the 1960s of a young girl and the respect that she would have uh, toward like her, her grandparents, but to also give her her strength. Um, because um, I think that was the thing that everybody could also really um, um, connect with. Um, it was important for me to do research, um, reading these newspapers, reading interviews, watching films and all of that so I can fill myself up with that world and then recreate it on paper. Um, I always tell myself the story first. Um, I tell it, I talk to myself, yes, I talk to myself. I talk to myself out loud and tell the story so that I have a sense of direction. Um, but then I change it here and there um, and I handwrite everything and then I start to type and then I retype. I might retype the whole story about maybe about four or five times. I do a lot of drafts to get it just right. Thank you for that. Thank you, that was such a good question. And um, I just wanna say thank you, Rita, for that, because I think it'll help a lot of, you know, the students here that are my age or maybe a little younger, um, you know, know the importance of, you know, keeping some memories. Hey, if, I, if you don't mind, how old are you? I am 13. Yeah, you okay so you are a whole lot more mature than I was at 13 so uh, so I think I'm right that the um, young people today are a lot more um, um, affluent you know than, <laughs> than what we were way back then okay go ahead. thank you um, the next question is from Muna um, and Muna was asking so how did you feel like when you published it or like when someone like, when you saw someone read your book, like how did you feel? Oh my goodness. It is like a dream come true. It truly is because like, you know, I've been at this for a long, long time. And although it isn't my first book, it is such a special book because I get to share a part of history that's not being told. And then I really grew to love the characters. Who'd have thunk, you, you make them up, but they feel so real. Um, and I have to tell you, like, whenever I see someone reading my book, you know, I get a little like excited and like, okay, behave yourself, Rita, leave them alone, let them read in peace, don't bother them. But part of me wants to go, hey, hi, I wrote that book, you know, <laughs> all excited and everything. It's, it's just, you know, it's a wonderful thing just to know that so many people are reading your book. Now, One Crazy Summer is 10 years old. Um, actually, it's a, she's 11 years old. And so um, it just feels so good to know that people are still reading this book. And I think it's because, the um, as, as it's noted, as you said, there's so much that's still relevant today. So I am just very thrilled to um, to have written it. Uh, but I can tell you, I'm real. I get really excited when I see other people reading it, reading my story. <laughs> I get so excited. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, that was a really good question, Luna. I think you also kind of you know made a few people happy today. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, a lot of people would be happy if, you know, somebody, you know, read their book. I get, because I know myself, I get happy when like somebody reads my paper for like school and they're like, oh my God, that was amazing. So yeah, it's, you know, you get the feedback too, you know, oh, this is what I like what you did here. Or I really yeah. like this character. Even when they say, oh, I didn't really like that character. Eh, she got on my nerves. I kind of like that too, because it makes the characters feel real. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so another question is from um, somebody else, um, and they were wondering if did you have like an author role, like a role model that's that was an author, and if you did, who? Okay, so. 
growing up, I didn't have an author role model. I just love stories. And the fact that, oh, all I got to do is write down on a paper, piece of paper, and it's a story, and I'm the author. All right, now, you know, um, so, so that was the, that was me in the beginning. But as I grew older, I knew that I had to improve my writing and that I wouldn't improve unless I, um, unless I read uh, people, um, other authors um, who, um, whose work I respect it. So I really, um, it, especially in college, I read, and after college, I read um, Toni Morrison, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, Alice Walker, um, um, Tony Cade Bambera, uh, Entezaki Shange, uh, who is, um, who, um, who's, um, her, her play, um, for colored girls who have committed suicide when the rainbow was enough. I saw that on Broadway twice. We were lucky my college had um, got tickets for a lot of us black kids to go up there and, and see it for like free. And I saw it twice and it just, I was like, wow, the power of words. Words don't just stand still. They, they like, they're so deep and they move and they grab you and they you know push you and so i thought wow i want to i don't want to just write flat i want i want to write words that really have texture that people can really feel so Intozaki shange tony morrison alice walker zora neale hurston tony k bam vera you know those are the women who who i've read a whole lot of so that i could really get a sense of what is writing and where is my voice in all of those voices. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, really, I think that really powers a lot of children here today. Um, so the next question um, was asking, so what advice would you give to kids who would want to become authors, like, you know, young authors or just authors? Okay, so um, I think everybody, everybody writes, everybody should write, whether you're going to publish it or um, share it with your friends or family or never show it to anybody. I think expression is so important. Um, uh, I suggest that you find someone whose work you admire and read like a writer read their first read their work for the enjoyment of it and then read it and ask yourself um take notes kind of oh wow this is what she did here oh i wonder why she used first person narrative you know start really thinking like a writer and looking at what the writer does and make notes just for yourself and the second thing so you know reading is reading is a number one but the second thing is, and primary is, you have to write, even if it's a little bit every day. Okay, so uh, um, I wrote 500 words a day because I was on a mission to make money. And I knew that, you know, I'd make a whole lot of money if I would write a lot of words every day. But you don't have to write 500 words every day. You can write, um, you could write a really good sentence or a really good paragraph every day uh, or write an idea for a story or write in the voice of a character that you are imagining or write a dialogue between two characters, whether you've got them in a story or not, um, or pick a place, a place that comes straight out of your imagination and, um, and describe it, you know, find little things for, um, to just kind of put yourself in the mode of, of creating something, um, expressing a thought um, uh, uh, or, um, you know, uh, telling a part of a story and just do a little bit, do a little bit every day and keep, um, keep something always for yourself. Not everything is to be shared. Learn to value your own thoughts and your own words. I think having a diary um, helped me to do that, uh, but just write a little bit every day. 
Thank you so much for that for that you know question. Um, that was a really great question. Um, and also Rita, um, thank you for that answer. I feel like you know I could relate to that a lot because honestly, I do have a lot of places in my mind, like just imaginary places that may like you know sometimes help me go to sleep or something, like to live in a utopia. Um, and yeah, I feel like for young kids like me or maybe in college who want to go to, you know, um, you know, get into their writing process and start writing books, you know, and become like a beautiful author like you, um, that I think that would help them a lot because I know kids have, you know, a lot of things in their mind um, that they can probably just be talking to themselves. And so like, you know, maybe instead of like talking to themselves, they could like write it out when, yeah. you know. Thank you so much. And, and you don't have to just write, you don't have to write on a paper like the way that I do. You mm -hmm. can write on your phone. You can even dictate it, like put on the um, recorder or, or, or even use your text, you know, um, and just, you know, write a little bit on your phone, however it's comfortable for you. Just do it. Thank you so much. Um, the next question um, was asking, uh, can you talk about the importance of youth activism and involvement in movements for change? Oh my goodness, where do we begin? I, I think that's one of the reasons why I did want to focus on the Black Panthers because it it is a youth movement. It was a youth movement. And then they even went younger and made sure that the children who were there were also participants. Um, there is nothing quite like the hope of the next generation. And so when you see that the next generation, um, um, young people, like um, I'm, I'm in my 60s. And so when I see people who are in their, um, who are not even in their teens and, and, and then, uh, and, and also teens, just getting involved being knowledgeable about what's going on. Um, and it doesn't even have to be on a depth, uh, on a deep level, but just simply um, knowing that there is a world out, outside of themselves and that not everybody is doing okay. And maybe, just maybe you might have some, uh, some uh, th there might be something that you can do um, just, to, uh, just to be of service, just to be of help. It does not take a whole lot to be of service. The first and foremost thing is knowledge. And this is why I uh, admire, this is what I admired in the Black Panthers. It was very important for the young people to have knowledge, um, for uh, even the, the young ones to know that where the lettuce came, that they ate came from, um, um, that, the, that the workers were not being treated well, you know, so that we could appreciate on a level that we can understand. Um, so, um, you know, just being knowledgeable. Uh, 20 years ago, I wrote a story called No Laughter Here. And it was a story about a girl um, and her best friend, an African girl and an African-American girl. Well, the African uh, girl went home to Nigeria um, uh, for a visit. And then when she came back to um, uh, the country, US, um, she was different. And her friend could not understand why. And what had happened was that she had undergone the right, uh, the ritual of female genital mutilation, which is the, um, which is, um, um, I'm not going to get graphic, but it uh, it is the um, it is the mutiliz mutil mutilization of the female genitals, your private parts, and so um, because. Now, that's a very hard subject to talk about, but I wanted to talk about it and I wanted to talk about it to young people because it happens to girls maybe around the age of eight. And so I thought it's very important to, add, um, to start talking to people at a young age about certain things and to be very skillful about how you talk about it so that they can understand without being traumatized themselves. 
And so the more that we know about other people in the world, um, the plight of other people in the world, the more that we have an appreciation for um, maybe for ourselves, okay, but then also that maybe we can do something. And so um, I got to see and hear about a lot of um, student activism on that subject just because they read the book. So it's very important to, even if you cannot go to Africa or wh where, wherever, you know, um, um, to arm yourself with knowledge. Knowledge is first and foremost, the, um, it's the key to activism. And then of course, lead with a good heart. And, and you will always, you'll always for, um, forward the cause of humanity. And I, and I just applaud all you young people on everything that you're doing, because every time I turn around, I read um, uh, someone is um, working in a soup kitchen or handing out sandwiches to the homeless or, you know, what, or um, uh, donating a book, you know, it just makes me feel good. It makes me say, you know what, the young people, they have it, they're going to be all right because they are coming from a good place. So, so I just like to encourage that and salute it. Um, thank you for that beautiful question. Um, and thank you, Rita, for that advice, because um, you might not know this, but I'm from Ghana next to, you know, Nigeria. Um, so I really appreciate that because I think it would be good for parents, not just for me or other teens my age, but also, you know, parents, because parents might have like, you know, a difficult time talking to their children about certain hard subjects yes. like race and racism in America or just, you know, history that not a lot of people know, like what you're talking about in Nigeria. I know that not a lot of people know that. I mean, I did, but not a lot of people. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, thank you. That was, that was a great question. Um, the next question um, was asking, so how did it feel to be like an award-winning author? You are a living legend. Oh my goodness. Let me tell you, it feels so good. <laughs> I will not lie to you. It feels wonderful. Um, mainly because, you know, I struggled a lot um, before One Crazy Summer. I had written, uh, you know, quite a few books before that, but, um, um, you know, so um, at the time before One Crazy Summer won a lot of awards, I was facing homelessness. I was, um, I had my apartment, but I was going to be evicted. I had a hard time paying my rent. And so um, because I came to the judge with the newspaper to say, look, um, I'm in this newspaper and my book might win an award. Um, I just need a few more months. And so when it did win all of those awards, you see everybody thought, oh, wow, you know, look at all those awards. And yes, th that, that came to me later. For me, I thought, <gasps> you know, I'm, I'm saved. I'm saved, and um, and so so that's the first thing that happened for me. Just the gratitude that that um, that I could that I could continue to, to live in my apartment and to write my books. That's so important. A lot of artists are um, are often just you know a month or two away from homelessness. So you know just keep that in mind, and that's why I try to support other artists because you never know someone's truth that they're living in. But uh, but yes, I, I'm I'm thrilled to to have the awards. Thank you so much. Um... I really appreciate you know, talking about your you know life and how you know happy you are about getting the awards because I'm pretty sure a lot of people would be happy too. Um, and you know, I mean, I would be really happy. Um, but I did want to say thank you. That was our very last question. Now we are going to invite 
my friend Fortune back for the second full for the second poll. And again, thank you for those beautiful questions and answers from the audience and Miss Rita. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jafita. Thank you so much, Rita. Great questions, everyone. That was fun. Before we wrap up our event and announce prize winners, I want to hear from you and a little bit about how you enjoyed this event this afternoon. Your feedback is very important to us. I'm going to launch our last engagement poll now. You have about two minutes to tell us how you're feeling Okay, so I noticed a lot of you are really happy and energized and ready for dinner, so am I. <laughs> and you guys, you guys' favorite part was the author talk, so it was um, mine, and um, the questions and the answers and participating in the poll. And a lot of you learned something new. Okay, thank you guys so much for partici participating in our last poll and coming to our event. We, t we look forward to seeing you next week for a last community author talk with Simon Nurul Ali, the author of Sadiq and the D Desert Star. I hope I said that right. Okay, thank you. We're so glad that you all were able to stay with us to the very end. I hope that you enjoy the author talk with Rita Williams Garcia today. What an honor. I want to share a reminder that we'll be hosting one more author talk with Simon Norali next Wednesday, um, March 17th at 4 p.m. with the same Zoom link. So please share with your friends and family members. You can access all of the global reading titles through the library's website. All you need to do is have a Seattle Public Library card or Seattle Public Schools Library Link member. And then you can download the books for free to your laptop or your phone, any device that you have at home. If you have any questions about how you can find these books, please call the library. We're more than happy to assist you. So again, mark your calendars. We look forward to seeing you next Wednesday. And so before we end our event, I want to give a special thank you to the Seattle Public Library Foundation, to East African Community Services, to Seattle Housing Authority for making these events possible. I want to thank our team leaders who are amazing and our author, um, Rita Williams Garcia, thank you for finding time to connect with us. Your story is powerful. We love, we love you and we love your books. Um, and most importantly, I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon. I know it's beautiful outside. The sky is blue and it's, it's so nice. So thank you for joining us today virtually to celebrate reading and our stories. Um, it was nice to be in community with you. We hope to see you next Wednesday at four o'clock to talk to our friend Simon Norale at four o'clock. So thank you and have a good night. That is going to be the end of our event. We look forward to seeing you next time. We'll see you all next week.